<laughs> All right, that's what I needed. Welcome yeah. to the MMA business section. Zane Simon <laughs> from BloodyElbow.com, joined by Eddie Mercado and Victor Rodriguez. We are here to break down Bell Bellator 174, Julia Budd versus Marlos Conan. And, um, you know, obviously, short on the star power of what was supposed to be a Fedor fight and, you know, some of the... Some of the Tito Ortiz, King Mo, big, you know, big name, big men that uh, Bellator has been showcasing. But top to bottom, one of the better Bellator cards they've come out with for a while, especially because it doesn't seem to be chock full of totally unknown prelim fighters making their debuts. Yeah, and I think uh, another thing is as Bellator continues on and continues on and they continue to build the female division – we're going to start to recognize these potential stars and we're going to be like, oh, Emily Ducote, I remember her. She put up a good fight. Let me tune in and see what she's doing. And she'll be on the prelims. So it's kind of enticing. Like, hey, come check out the prelim stream. So, I mean, I like that they're really, they're really doubling down on the, on the online thing and, and really going for it. So kudos to them. I like the name value here. Yeah, it's it's a lot better on the undercard, and we'll get into it in a minute, than they've been for quite a while. And slowly but surely, they are starting to put together enough recognition in their women's division that I at least, yeah, you know, I look at it and I, I remember Dakota and Holloway and some of these other fighters as well. So, Vic, what are your thoughts on this before we start talking about the actual fights? Yeah, I mean, a minor a minor complaint here would be the fact that Again, it's another one of these cards that it would be nice if they got more promotion and more attention. It would be yeah. nice to have a little more visibility to really reap the benefits of what you're going to get. Because really, there is a great degree of quality here. And we are obviously, we're going to get into uh, uh, the fights themselves, of course. But, you know, just looking at the undercard itself, there's some really, uh, really interesting things going on with not only who they have booked, but how they're having them booked as well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's just really it's sort of the same old, same old in, in the, as far as uh, how they continue to, I guess, take the same approach when it comes to uh, advertising or getting the word out there. Hey, we've got this great product and maybe you should check it out. But, you know, other than that, at least the quality's there. So, you know, it kind of, it doesn't exactly balance things out, but it's better than having it the other way around. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly better than, uh, you know, something like the Bellator card they just had in Northern Ireland, where not only did nobody know about it, but you could not pay people to care about that card. Yeah. I now, mean, that was, that was a strange one too, because it's like, yeah, sure. For the local crowd, it was great. They stacked it on top of a Bama card. So it kind of worked out well for the live event, but I mean, you know, that plus the tape delay and all that, I, I don't understand it. And they're never going to get rid of the tape delay apparently because it know, works. They, I, That's the well, thing. Does it really? I mean, you're already seeing spoilers online for the fights you want. Their well, rate, I think their, their ratings probably tell them it works. Well, their ratings well, tell them that it's, there's not much difference between doing it live and doing it on a tape delay. So yeah. there's really well, no cause to force a live production if you don't really fiscally have to. And that's yep. kind of where they're at. Yeah, and I guess they get to sandwich a lot of commercials between uh, rounds and between fights. I mean, they already have their timetable set once the event is over. So I guess it makes sense. Yeah, if people aren't – if, if you know, the hardcore fan community may care, but, you know, they don't – they only make up so much of your viewership for anything. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, so, yeah, getting in looking at this undercard, I have to say I'm a little surprised to see Alexis Dufresne buried on the undercard considering she is coming off a win over the headliner. Hmm. Yeah, that's but you know what? From what I hear, uh, Coonan said that Dufresne was offered the rematch instantly, and she turned it down. She said, "Go get the title first, and then we can do the rematch." So that yeah. could be why they're like, "Oh, well, if you want to be like that, well, then we'll just push you down in the prelims." And you know, I, I would I would offer that what you mentioned is true, but I'd also add to that the fact that she did miss weight. Apparently, yeah, but, by all accounts, didn't seem too remorseful about it. Didn't seem too, you know, bothered by the whole thing. So I don't know. Yeah, but that's no excuse to bury a fighter after the best performance of their career. No, I understand. But I mean, if that is, if it is a, a petty thing, then sure. But then you also have to wonder the name value probably isn't there. Although, again, this is where it comes back around to what I just mentioned. She did just beat your most viable and famous woman in the in 
the organization. So, yeah, you know. but on the same token, you have to look at the fact that we've seen her really three times on the big stage and two were terrible. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. you can't risk putting that on your main card. To I, be quite well, honest. I mean, you can if you're going against Marlis Coonan because Coonan will perform or show up or you have a huge upset, which is a big deal. But just to yeah. put her in there against Gabby, I'm not sure that's that should be on the main card. I either. mean, I I would I mean I, over Fernando Gonzalez, Brandon Gertz, Steve Garcia. Like you're not talking about like Bellator has enough empty slots on their main cards to afford somebody who has a win over Marlos Kunin a spot. You know, th- this isn't a promotion that's always been got- gone the safe route with like, oh, if this person underperforms, we shouldn't put them on our main card. Well, They're- another thing is if, let's say, she gets a, a finish in the prelims, yeah. they could put it on the main card. They but can. if she looks terrible, they can just act like it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, and and there's, like, there's some sense to it. I'm just saying it. I would like to see – women in Bellator. I'm glad to see more women in Bellator fighting more consistently, seeing yeah. consistent women's fights. That's The promotion needs that. But I would like to see more fighters gaining actual promotional momentum fight to fight, which yes. we still don't see. We still don't see fighters winning a fight and like winning a big fight and then getting another big fight. It'll be like, and now they're back on this you know, way, way down on a prelim or stuffed away on something else where you don't care. And you, it just never seems like other, outside of a title fight, they're not doing much with it. And even Conan has had that trouble where she got buried on a couple cards on the prelims. Yeah, It's just, it's still really hard for women to seem to find any promotional momentum as Bellator fighters. Anyway, also on this undercard, uh, Justin Wren, former UFC heavyweight, big pygmy, is fighting again. It's his annual fight. He's been. It's fighting his annual years. fight. Hopefully, is also probably accompanied his annual fundraiser for uh, fight for the forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. So always, you know, Justin Wren. He doesn't have to have that big a career. He doesn't have to do that much. He's out there doing good works and using fighting to make it happen. So I'm always yeah. happy to see him out there. Yeah. And uh, we got Cody Fister, former former UFC, the the fist the fist of the North Star of the oh no of the Lone Star State, as I like to call him. Nice Texan. Yeah, I don't know why it would be the fist. That's just so lame. I yeah. would go with uh, the double, right? Cody the double <laughs> fister. Is oh that not the best, right? Hang on, let me clear my let me clear my browser history. Hang on a second. You just reminded me of something. Never mind. Okay, uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> fister is now in Bellator for making his. This is, I believe, is his promotional debut after being released from the UFC. I'm actually kind of surprised that he got picked up by Bellator from the UFC. Mm-hmm. Um. Of all the guys they've passed on over time, Fister did not seem like an ace in the hole for somebody who would make the jump. Maybe quickly. he was affordable. Yeah, I'm sure he was. It just still, you know. Uh, and other, yeah, otherwise it's a solid undercard of veterans and rising fighters. Rafael or Rafael Lovato Jr., a notable jujitsu instructor. On the and card. The champion. I, he was like the third American to win uh, one of the Brazilian national championships or something like that. The man yeah. is a the man is a goddamn wizard, and I think we're gonna be in for a treat, especially now that it looks like he got bumped up to the main card. Oh, did he? I'm not sure. Yeah, it that looks like it from it. yeah, we'll tell that you might need a Oh, I refreshed. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, they just updated that. So oh, they changed that's his a, opponent also. Oh, they just changed the whole card. Oh yeah, they oh, updated wow. a bunch of stuff. Yeah, um, we so did Tamango have Andre... missed weight, and that fight has been canceled. Yes. Oh wow! Breaking news, everybody! Breaking, Breaking news. news. Now and you know. Rhodes missed weight, and that fight has been canceled. So yes. Kendall Grove versus Mike Rhodes is off. Yep. And Steve Garcia versus Joe Timonglo is off. Man, just when we were like, oh, look at all the name value. Yeah, and let's not forget that Chris Honeycutt was supposed to be on this card. 
Uh, he got injured. Andre Koreshkov was going to fight Fernando Gonzalez, and Koreshkov got injured as well. So, you know, we it does it does take something of a hit, you know. Yeah, no, that it sucks. Is is. Yeah, honestly, that <laughs> that really kills a large portion of my interest now. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I yeah. Eddie was Eddie was like wasn't liking this Kendall Grove uh, Mike Rhodes fight, but honestly, that was like one of the big things that the top two fights on this card. I liked that that fight. I thought that was a fun fight and a cool fight to make. No, I so, let me let me be specific here. I <laughs> like the fight. Like I would definitely <laughs> engage in it and be entertained. But as the co-main event, I just wasn't thrilled yeah. with it. Yeah, no, I can see that. I can see that. I mean, it stylistically seems fun, but I, I would agree with your your uh, point as far as it being necessarily cold. But then, you know, you also got to look at the way that some of these Bellator events are structured. And this isn't a knock on Bellator, but, you know, what is a co-main event really these days? You know, the, the, the stellar attraction of like that one fight prior to the main event, like, you know, even the UFC doesn't necessarily put too much weight behind that. So I, I don't know. I, I don't take that kind of, I don't really take any umbrage to that. Oh, also notable... Wayman Carter, Rafael Lovato's uh, opponent, is injured and off the card. So Carter, or so Lovato is now facing last-second replacement Charles Hackman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. On that note. Cool. So Justin Wren, right? <laughs> yeah, Justin Wren. About Lovato Hackman. I mean, Lovato is basically probably going to twist something off of him in the first round. But if you guys have any additional things you want to add, we don't have odds for it. I mean, uh, four zero. Uh, all four of those have come by finish. One K, one TKO, three subs, and he's probably going to take an arm home. I yeah. know nothing about Chris Hackman though. <laughs> I know he's four and four. Well, you know, obviously not because his name is Charles. So there, there goes your. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It happens all the time. Um, yeah, I, I think Lovato's going to probably go with something like an armbar or something like that. I, I don't know. It's probably going to be one of those um, sweep to get on top, very classic jiu-jitsu performances. I really didn't know about the Hackman thing until like five minutes ago. Um, I didn't know about it until the oh, – I, I refreshed the browser. Like, I got to keep refreshing this thing because I feel like this whole card's just going to keep changing on me. Yeah. Well, I mean, and again, this isn't a knock against Hackman or anything like that. I just have that much faith in Lovato based on how I've seen him perform. He's four and so. four. Hackman's four and four. I mean, come on. Yeah, it's more cage experience than Lovato's got, but then again, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, you know, let me not, say this, though, real quick, if I may. The, one of the most interesting things to me about this complete shift in the card is how much movement has been on the betting line. There's been a lot of a lot of movement on some of these lines, and now those matches aren't even going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, <sighs> unfortunately. So now we also have Justin Wren versus Roman Pizzolatto, and uh, you know, I as an, another fight, we don't have any odds on this. I don't know much about Pizzolatto, but. Also, judging by his record, this seems like a good showcase for Ren. What are your thoughts on this, Vic? Any yeah, P- Pizzolatto is a guy who's uh, sort of, you know, he's been bouncing around the regional circuit, Tennessee, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana. And, uh, you know, with his 9-7 and seven record, he does hit pretty hard. He does have much more of a stand-up base. Um, it's kind of weird how we always talk about fighters that aren't very good at shifting between striking and grappling situation with him is he doesn't seem to shift very well between punching and kicking and then grappling. So there's sort of like a stutter stab moment with all that stuff. And it's cost him dearly. Uh, he can get tagged pretty easily. He's been dropped. I mean, uh, you know, I don't see him doing very well against somebody who's primarily a wrestler, especially somebody like Ren, who despite his age and the time that he took off and the bouts with malaria and everything else that he suffered in the jungle. And dysentery. And dysentery, which he did not die from, hashtag Oregon Trail. Uh, you know, I, I just – how Ren doesn't put this guy away, you know, it, it's one of those situations. So, Ren's also uh, only 29 if you're talking about age, so. Well, true, but, I mean, a guy who's been wrestling since a very young age and he's already been through some rigors. Like, I mean, and I get it. I mean, like, does, he's, he does have some wear and tear despite his young age, but – He's still, I guess, fresher, you know, because he did have that hiatus, all things considered. He's a heavyweight. Heavyweights age weird anyway. 
They do. They do. He could very well be fighting until he's 40 for all we know. I mean, it's, yeah. it's nuts. So, yeah, I, I don't have that much faith here in uh, Pizzolatto. Nothing against him. But I, it just it really, really does seem like this is entirely stacking the deck for Ren to get a good win. Any thoughts from you, Eddie? Uh, yeah, I'm going to take Ren by decision. I think he's going to stand on the outside and work his jab, point at the ground, throw a right every now and again, and uh, come up with the win. His opponent, interesting fact, is uh, a complete savage in terms of he's going to finish you or he's going to be finished, right? So nine wins, nine finishes, uh, six losses, six finishes. Seven losses, seven, seven finishes. Total. There, that's even worse. Sure Dog has him at six, <laughs> but what do they know? <laughs> but yeah, so this guy's either going to get the finish, which I doubt he will in Justin Wren, or he's going to get finished. But uh, – Justin Wren, I think, is just too nice. I think he's going to stand on the outside and just pepper him with the jab and pick up the decision. So, Yep. All right. Well, that brings us to the co-main event. Fernando Gonzalez, Brandon Gertz, now a catchweight bout of 174 pounds. Since I'm assuming Gertz must – somebody must have missed weight. I don't know who. Um, no, I think it's probably the fact that it's relatively last minute because of the Koreshkov injury. Mm. It might be that. Or, or maybe they did. I don't know. I don't see anything about him missing weight here. It's possible. Let's see. It says Gertz weighed in at 165. Mm. That can't be right. There and you go. Gonzalez weighed in at 174. Mm-hmm. Jesus. That sounds like a last minute arrangement then. Yeah, but, I, I, mean, I the, guess the it nature... must be. That's just a really weird last-minute arrangement because, mm. I mean, Gertz, Fernando Gonzalez against Andre Korshkov, like, Gertz is the one coming in at, la- on, at last minute. Yes. If Gonzalez was scheduled to fight Korshkov at 170. Yes. Which means Gonzalez still missed by four pounds, even with Gertz being five pounds under. So you've got a 10-pound weight mm. difference in a fight that's taking place that was set for 170 pounds. Well, it, it smells like to me it was probably one of those things where Koreshkov got injured, Gonzalez probably stopped cutting weight, and then they said, no, hold up, we do have a replacement, and then they're like, oh, well, let's just do this instead. And he's fighting well, a guy who mostly fights at lightweight. When did Koreshkov get injured? Uh, that I don't remember. Then I'm not yeah, exactly seeing the date. Yeah, been in for a little bit. Maybe not hmm. that long. I don't know. Anyway, what, do, what are your thoughts on this fight, Eddie? Uh, that weight thing is strange to me and odd to me. It matters. That definitely matters when you have Gertz who's going to try to come in and, and take Gonzalez down. Um, I can't see Gertz looking to outstrike Gonzalez. Gonzalez is a banger. So, and Go- Gonzalez has shown that he can be taken down. So that's Gertz's path to victory for sure. But that weight, it, it makes me think of Will Brooks versus Cowboy Oliveira. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like the weight discrepancy in that fight made such a difference, and and this might be something similar to that. So initially, I was taking Gertz in this. I thought he was going to be able to put Gonzalez on his back and and really uh, do his thing. But Gertz is kind of becoming a guy I can't trust. You know, he'll have like some really wickedly awesome performances, some really fast finishes, and then just look kind of out of sorts out there and almost just lackadaisical. Uh, I don't know. They, they're both really coming off of not really good performances. They were both really passive in their last fight. And, and, and the crowd wasn't too excited to see this. Man, I'm going to have to pick Gonzalez here by decision. But the, the interest in this has just really just gone to shit. It really has. Man. Yeah, suddenly seeing the like I, it was a fight I was interested in, but seeing that there's a ten pound weight difference, this is just weird. It just it's just it's just a weird fight now. It's certainly not a co-main event. It was like a fun filler on the main card because Fernando Gonzalez can is 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 a scrapper. Yeah, and Gertz can knock people out. Yeah. What what are your thoughts on it, Vic? Well, you see the thing here with this particular fight, and I don't know when. I was trying to look here to see if there's anything on when. Uh, Koreshkov's injury took place to kind of establish a timeline, see how ready Gertz was. I, I'm not really sure. I mean, again, you have a guy coming up from lightweight to fight a welterweight that's actually a little – came in a little heavier in the official weight. Who knows what he's going to weigh come fight time. Um, not only that, Gertz's wrestling has been, you know, 
a pretty reliable part of his arsenal. But Gonzalez has that sort of team quest, upper body, dad strength, you know, to shut down a lot of the takedowns that kind of come his way. So that and the fact that his boxing is a bit underrated, the fact that he's a lot sneakier with his hands than people seem to think, uh, he's able to sneak in that left sometimes. And it just it, – his ability to disrupt the pace of his opponent – is, is one thing. His boxing game being more developed, I think at least, than Gertz's, and his uh, his his power being definitely far more uh, far heavier than 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 Gertz's. I, I don't know, man. I, it doesn't seem to me like Gertz is going to have the ability to shut him down unless there's some sort of situation where there's a mad scramble that ends up in some kind of a back take or something really savvy like that. Um, so that sort of frontal technique when it comes to straight up wrestling approach in order to establish uh, dominance and, and continue grinding at that pace. I don't really see that working for Gertz in this one. Um, and yeah, again, I mean, Gonzalez, I don't know what his gas tank is going to be like. Um, it's been somewhat reliable so far. Although in the last few fights, he has seemed a bit gun shy. I mean, he's gotten a lot smarter at picking his opportunities, but I don't know, man, again, I just, it, it still seems like he has, enough to get ahead in this fight and be able to just do enough damage, even if it's only by a decision, just do enough damage to really leave no doubt as to who the winner of this fight is. So I am going to go with Gonzalez by decision on this one. Yeah. Uh, Korshkov was out with injury on, by, fe- that was reported February 7th. So three weeks. Yeah. There you go. Which doesn't leave many excuses for, well, I mean, Gertz didn't co- miss weight. He came in five pounds underweight. But so right, it doesn't well, leave any it, excuses either for Gonzalez to miss weight and think that the fight I, was off. I guess it. I guess it depends. It would. I that's, mean, that's like what we have to see. I don't know. And and yeah. Even like even then though, it, it, at at worst, you're talking like two weeks maybe. They're not gonna like let you know. They're not gonna tell Gonzalez his fights off three weeks ago and then come back five days before the card and be like, oh, actually, we have yeah. an opponent for you. Like it, no, it right. had to have been like at most a week later, they were like, oh, we'll find you an opponent and then get him an opponent. So there is the underdog coming in, opening at plus 135, now to plus 160. Gonzalez, the favorite, minus 175, dropped way down to minus 200, now back up to minus 180. Um, There's too much weirdness going around that to do anything with it, frankly. You said it, man. Yeah, you said it. Stay Very away weird. from this. This just yeah. smells terrible. I don't bet on any of this shit. At and all. then, so that brings us to our main event now: Marlos Conan versus Julia Bud. Uh, Vic, what are your thoughts on this fight? Yeah, this is an interesting one. I think we were commenting earlier on Twitter about how the betting lines, uh, at least earlier in the day, had Bud as the favorite over Conan. And um, you know, I mean, my first thought was like, well, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know. I mean, Bud has that sort of hard-nosed grinding style. Um, She's really good at controlling, and she takes a hell of a lot of punishment while being savvy enough to avoid submissions. Um, Kunin, as Eddie had mentioned, was coming off a loss, and, you know, we're not really sure what she's going to look like bouncing back. Now, considering the massive upset that that fight was, the uh, loss against Dufresne, um, even with that, I mean, she, and, and I know that we probably shouldn't be swayed by what people say in their interviews, but it does seem like not only is Kunin saying the right things, or she really seems to have the, the the right kind of focus that somebody who just lost the way she did should have. You know, she did admit to being somewhat arrogant and that she thought, you know, well, I'm just going to breeze through and this will be it. You know, it's not going to be a problem. And if she really did, in fact, redouble her efforts to get back into training and work on the things that she was missing, then... I don't really see – I don't know, man. I, I, I think she will be crafty enough to set something up in terms of either submitting Bud off her back or being able to, you know, work a way to stand up and at least keep the fight in a better striking range. Her striking is not as powerful as Bud's, but it is more complete. Her timing is a little better. Uh, I, I'd have to say that Kunin's going to win this probably by decision. I don't see either one – finishing the other in this fight. Eddie, your thoughts? Um, I think this is a very close match. I I'm I have no problem with the way the odds opened up. I think Bud opened as just a slight 
uh, favorite and Kunin the slight underdog. And then the money started. The money. Oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. Kunin is a legend. She, we know what she's capable of. We know she has submissions from her back. She has sweeps. We know she's willing to stand and trade. We've seen her drop people with a straight right hand. We've seen her trade in the pocket with Cyborg. Um, didn't end too well for her there, but she is, I mean, she is battle tested. She's tough. She's pretty durable. Um, and she's complete. I mean, she's a well-rounded fighter. A knock on her could be she's extremely comfortable off her back, like really comfortable because she knows she can submit you. She knows she can – she knows it so much that she is willing to stay there just to keep hunting for that submission. And that kind of plays to her detriment in this stylistic matchup here. Julia Budd is going to want to be on top, and she's going to want to um, try to grind her out. And Bud has shown the ability to give up space that's necessary to, uh, to sneak those submissions in there or get the sweep. So that, that's the interesting area of this fight for me, is what happens when it hits the ground. Can Bud be dominant? Can she be smothering and give Coonan nothing? Can Coonan be, be slick off her back and, and, and catch Bud uh, making a mental error? Um, Bud is a phenomenal athlete. I mean, she is a, she is a phenomenal specimen. And, and that's going to be tough for Kunin to deal with, especially as Kunin's, you know, getting older. Uh, the knock on Bud is she will not engage in the stand-up battle. It's, like, not her area. She just doesn't fuck with it. Um, we've seen her coaches – just desperately trying to get her to, to work on her stand up against certain opposition. And she just, for whatever reason, will not pull the trigger when she's in there. She did stand for the first round against Arlene Blanco in her last fight. But I mean, she wasn't her best strike is her knees. Her knees from the clinch are her strongest, most devastating strike. Um, but she has to get there first. And, and she does fairly well in the clinch. And I think she could find some success there if she puts Kunin against the clinch. Um, she'll have to worry about Kunin's elbows. Kunin it definitely will get nasty on the inside. Um, but Bud can definitely put her against the fence, get her to the ground, and, and keep it there. And I can see her squeaking out a decision. That's definitely plausible. Um, I'm going to pick Kunin here. A little bit biased because I'm a gigantic Marlis Kunin fan. And I'm not going to pretend I'm not. Um, but I think she is a killer. She's a finisher. She's finished 20 of 23 fights by, by finish, three by TKO or KO, and 17 by submission. So I think Bud will lose to a certain level of competition, and I think that level of competition is Marlis Kunin. So I'm picking Marlis Kunin to win the inaugural featherweight Bellator title. By submission. Yeah, I think I got to side with you on this one, Eddie. And it's um, the biggest thing I think is that partially, as you say, with the striking and Bud not pulling the trigger enough, and just more generally, Bud kind of just fights to her level of competition. A lot of times she fights down to her competition. Uh, and I don't know necessarily that she's capable of fighting above her level of competition. Um. She, I mean, she even came, she has a Muay Thai background. That's what she came to MMA with and has never been a striker of any note. And Kunin is very much, she's aggressive enough that her game over the past, you know, pretty much over her whole career has always been kill or be killed. Like she has only lost by decision twice and all her other losses are submission or KO. And I think if she makes, if she pushes Bud to be aggressive or lose, Bud will lose. That's my feeling. Especially if, if she tags Bud early on the feet, Bud's not pulling the trigger at all. And then yeah. she's going to be telegraphing takedowns, telegraphing her way into the clinch, and that can get her hit even more. So, so I, I got to go with 
Um, I got to go with Conan here. You know, she's she's going to work for finishes. And I think when she does, Julia Budd is either going to give up rounds or get submitted. So It's an excellent fight, though. I got to say, for, for the 145 title, this is an excellent fight. It is. Bud is currently the favorite, uh, opening at minus 140, now up to minus 183. So she's the favorite in climbing. Conan opening at plus 100, now up to plus 149. I got to feel like if Conan keeps climbing, she's worth a bet at underdog. I mean, she's worth a bet at underdog odds at all, I think. Especially, oh, they don't have any... Um, yeah, you could go under two and a half rounds, but frankly, if Bud is winning, it's just gonna probably yeah, be a slog. So that, yeah. So I, I think I think a straight bet on Conan as an underdog makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah I'm with it. Because e- even if you think that Bud will win this fight, um, there's a pretty solid argument that this would be. I mean, this would be absolutely the best win of Bud's career other than a, a very early win over Jermaine Durandamy, who's got completely different post- stylistic matchup problems or and st- a completely different stylistic matchup than Conan. Yeah, I would agree. So, mm-hmm. uh, any last thoughts before we wrap this up? Oh, One last yeah. thing. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead, Vic. No, no. I just wanted to mention, uh, if you are so inclined, M1 has an event this weekend, Alexander Shlomenko. So this is where the tangential Bellator relationship comes in. Uh, Shlomenko is going to be fighting this this weekend, so that should be fun. And, of course, everybody knows about UFC 209. That should also be dope. All right, Nettie? I was just going to say how weird it is that this card shifted up mid-show, like completely different main card. It's it's definitely odd. I'm not sure if I've ever seen uh, such a shuffle in a main in a main card before. Like right at the last minute. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a weird one. Hey, don't feel bad, Eddie. Remember when we used to do those World Series of Fighting events that you know there was that rash of like five events in a row that had that same problem. Yeah. Well, those yeah. usually it happens where we'll do the whole show and then the card will completely fall apart like the moment we're done. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> all right well thank you guys for joining me you can find me on twitter at the zane simon you can find eddie on twitter at the eddie mercado you can find vic on twitter at vic and rodriguez you can find all three of us over at bloodyelbow.com in our various capacities if you're watching this over on youtube give it a thumbs up that's this thing like it share it whatever that all helps us a ton subscribe to mmanation.com that's d-o-t-c-o-m that is our youtube channel it's where you get all the latest bloody yellow shows interviews analysis all that good stuff uh, we will be back next week. Oh, I'll be back for the sixth round after the UFC 209, and we'll be back next week for Knuckle Up and If I Did It and Heavy Hands and doing Vivisection and Care Don't Care for UFC Fortaleza, the Belfort versus Gaslam card. So stay tuned for all that, and thank you for tuning in.